Hi, I'm Satnam Sangera. I'm a writer and a journalist. I live in London, and I'm going to show you a part of Britain in the Midlands where I originally came from. It's a fine day, people open windows, they leave their houses just for a short while. They walk by the grass and they look at the grass, they look at the sky. It's going to be a fine night tonight, it's going to be a fine day tomorrow. Da, 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 da. I'm a journalist. I work for the Times newspaper in London, and I'm also a writer. My first book, The Boy with the Top Knot, is a memoir telling the story of my Sikh family, who are originally from the Punjab in India and came to live in Wolverhampton in the British Midlands. Well, I really hope you like this. Yeah, I hope and, um, I'm sure spread I the word if you do. I'm sure if you don't like it, keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My second book, Marriage Material, is a novel that echoes my own journey in life. It describes a man who works hard to leave small town working class Wolverhampton for middle class London. But at some point, he gets dragged back to his family and his history. My family came to Britain in the 1960s. The UK had opened its borders for the inhabitants of former colonies in the Commonwealth. Mass immigration helped recruit workers into the factories and heavy industry of Wolverhampton. Thousands came from the West Indies and the Punjab. So my mum is 16 there. I think 16, Saudi? Oh. Saudi? Oh, 16. And my dad is about 17. My dad came first. Um, he was called over by his father. And then um, my mum was called over to marry him. So they had, hadn't actually met each other until their wedding day. This was in 1968. So my mum and dad came at a time where race was a really big issue. 20 to 30 additional immigrant children are arriving from overseas in Wolverhampton alone every week. One of Wolverhampton's MPs was Enoch Powell. In the year of my parents' arrival, he made an incendiary speech, which still counts as one of the most controversial statements ever made about race in Britain. Powell became a byword for racism. It is like watching a nation busily engaged in heaping up its own funeral pyre. Nowadays, the anti-immigration message is channeled by UKIP, the UK Independence Party. Their popularity has made immigration a big issue in the coming elections of May. Are we having the same debate all over again? What did we learn from history? I'm going back to my home in the black country to try to answer these questions. The region got its name from the black soot of heavy industry and from the blackness of its coal. But when I grew up, I thought it was called the black country because there were so many black people around. Wolverhampton is exactly 220 kilometers from London. I know. I must have done this journey 600 times. I come back every few weeks to see my family. So growing up, we'd say we're probably quite poor, weren't we? Yeah. But we never felt poor, because we ate well, you know, we kind of, you know, if we wanted something for education, we always got it, didn't we? Yeah, although I, yeah, I felt a bit poor. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I went to the grammar school, where everyone was very rich, it? and they all went on holidays, and they went skiing holidays, and um, I never know? did, you know. I couldn't afford the bus fare to see my friends, and whereas they, some of them had cars, you know. 
ਤੋਂ ਇਹ ਕਹਿ ਤੋ ਕਿ ਮੈਂ ਕਦੇ ਵੀ ਇੰਗਲੈਂਡ ਚ ਆਈ ਆ ਇੱਕ ਟਾਈਮ ਇੱਕ ਪੌਂਡ ਵੀ ਕੋਲ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਮੈਂ ਕਦੇ ਇਹ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਸੋਚਿਆ ਵੀ ਆਹ ਕੰਮ ਕਿੱਦਾਂ ਹੋਊਗਾ ਮੈਂ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਪ੍ਰਮਾਤਮਾ ਚ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਮੇਰਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਵੀ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਉਹ ਪ੍ਰਮਾਤਮਾ ਕੰਮ ਕਰਦਾ ਰਿਹਾ ਮਾਈ ਮਮ ਬਿਕੇਮ ਮੋਰ ਡਿਵੈਲਪਡ ਜਸਟ ਬਿਫੋਰ ਸ਼ੀ ਹੈਡ ਮੀ ਥਿਸ ਇਜ਼ ਵਾਟ ਆਈ ਲੁਕ ਲਾਈਕ ਵਨ ਆਸ 8 ਇਅਰਸ ਓਲਡ ਆਈ ਲੁਕ ਲਾਈਕ ਅ ਗਰਲ ਐਸ ਹਰ ਯੰਗੈਸਟ ਬੋਏ ਆਈ ਬਿਕੇਮ ਹਰ ਰਿਲੀਜੀਅਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਜੈਕਟ I grew up with uncut hair as is required for religious Sikh boys and men covered in a top knot or a turban. When I went to primary school, nobody took notice of how I looked. School felt like home, not least because I was related to so many of my fellow pupils. Many of my 54 cousins were here. been years which <laughs> has the headmaster mr ball played an important role in my life i did not speak any english like many other pupils when i first came here but in one or other way the school managed to get us all very well educated oh yeah well <laughs> well basically two words hard work and expertise i suppose as well also discipline uh, oh discipline as well yes <laughs> actually uh, he did have the cane he used to you used to have the gym slipper but that's right yes we used to it's get cane, uh, but, uh, corporal punishment so if you were very naughty you used to get it was very rare but the point is uh, there was there was always the threat people realized they couldn't get away with uh, something that was not very good my mum would rather believe what mr ball was saying rather than her own children you know your his word was gospel you know what i mean um so i guess that helped your teaching you know it made the school oh, a easier place to run it helped sir yeah but we 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 didn't find uh, problems or many problems that couldn't be solved it was mr ball who convinced my parents to send me to wolverhampton grammar school i had to do an exam passed it and then had to apply for a government assisted place even though it's only a few miles from where i was living it was it felt like a world away and no one all my cousins thought you know i'd be wearing a top hat and i'd be flogged be flogged every day cuz no one in my family had been to a school like this and they thought i was really posh and i actually weirdly felt really homesick I guess the most difficult part of my life in terms of identity was when I was about 14 and um I think I had a proper crisis and cutting my hair when I was 14 was a major decision about who I wanted to be and um I think I made the right decision. I think it's possible to be Sikh, a secular Sikh uh, and also British. ਕਾਰਦੀ ਉਦੋਂ ਵੀ ਜਦੋਂ ਗਾਂ ਮਾਰ ਕੇ ਲੈ ਤੇ ਲਈ ਉਹ ਫਿਰ ਹੋ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਯਾ ਮਾਈ ਟੈਸਟ ਡਰਾਈਵ ਕਾਰਸ ਫਾਰ ਅ ਬਿਜ਼ਨਸ ਮੈਗਜ਼ੀਨ ਇਟਸ ਆਲਵੇਸ ਨਾਈਸ ਟੂ ਡਰਾਈਵ ਅ ਲਵਲੀ ਕਾਰ ਲਾਈਕ ਥਿਸ ਮੈਜ਼ਰਾਟੀ ਬਟ ਇਕੁਅਲੀ ਇਟਸ ਆਲਵੇਸ ਕੁਆਇਟ ਨਾਈਸ ਟੂ ਗਿਵ ਇਟ ਬੈਕ ਇਨ ਵਨ ਪੀਸ ਐਂਡ ਹੈਵਿੰਗ ਸਰਵਾਈਵ ਦ ਟੈਸਟ ਡਰਾਈਵ Wolverhampton is very close to Birmingham, Britain's second city, which has a vibrant cultural life. I'm going to chair a conversation in the brand new library with Mira Saya. She is a very popular actress and novelist who originally comes from the region as well, and she has become one of Britain's most famous Asian faces. I did I think I spoke quite authentic black country dialogue for a while like stop blotting and give me a donate 
She's like, you know, don't cry and give me a hand. I mean, I don't know where Donnie comes from, or Blart, for that matter. And then I literally open the door, put a foot over and go, hello, mummy, hello, daddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to do my maths homework. <laughs> well, I, fain I failed the audition for my own audiobook, so... Uh, <laughs> Did you? I know that feeling. <laughs> they said I, w I didn't have the right voice. Really? Yeah. What they meant is that I've become so posh, I can't do the black country accent anymore. Can you? Oh, good one. Well. Oh, no, you can. You're an actress. I can't do it. It's only when I've drunk five, five pints. It comes out. You could yeah. do it. Go on. I'm yeah, going down the shop. I shops. can't. Honestly, I can't. <laughs> Come on, car. Come I on. The more you do it, the more London I get. Okay. What's happened to him? This is terrible. <laughs> Anyone of any caste and religion can come to a Sikh temple and get fed. And actually one of my memories of coming here as a kid is seeing lots of homeless people here would come and just have a, a, you know, a bit of curry and a chapati. So my mum would come here often at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning and start making food for strangers. But also the temple was a place we came to if there was any danger. So in, in the early 80s there was the Hansworth riots where far-right activists were um, attacking Asian shops in Birmingham and it was thought that the next area would be Wolverhampton. They were going to come here. So the whole community, or our family anyway, we came to the temple and we stayed in the temple overnight. We locked the gates and there was a Sikh with a, a Qurban standing at the gates to protect us. But that's one of my first memories of, is of everyone being locked up. And it, was, it felt safe, but also I remember it feeling a bit scary because all the house windows are boarded up with wooden wooden um, shutters. So it was a kind of dangerous time. <laughs> you go to school in Wolverhampton? Yeah, 20 primary school. Okay, and do you like school? Yeah, mostly not. Uh, mostly some of the kids <sighs> sometimes push me around. They bully you? Yeah, sometimes. Why do they bully you? Well, mostly because I'm different. Well, there is one boy. How are you different? I'm the kid that I'm different by, you know. Oh, because you got a top knot? Well, I used to have a top knot too. So it's quite hard to have a top knot. But do you, do you want a top knot? Or do yeah, you... because it helps me do things. I mean... Helps you what? It helps me stop people hurting me. If I try, to, no one tried to hurt me. I'm, when I go, I keep getting more and more friends to get, to, to get the ones that bully me and stop them. It would stop three. This is a socially significant temple. In the 1960s, it was a focal point for the battle for equal rights. Sikhs came from all around the country to express their solidarity. Here, the orthodox Sikhs have come across another difficulty. Their religion demands that they wear turbans and beards. The transport department's regulations, which have been unchanged for 40 years, forbid this. One of the protesters was Kamaljit Singh, who is still a bus driver. In the 1945, First World War and Second World War, when the Sikh was fighting against to save British, and then nobody asked them, so you can't be a turban when you drive in a tank. Yeah. You drive and fight in front of the main line. And nobody said nothing. 
But yeah, I think this is a lot of the anger at the time was about that fact that tens of thousands of Sikhs had fought for Britain in World War One and Two and died. No, 83,000. Yeah, 83,000 Sikhs died, died in the World War. And yet, and when they fought, they wore turbans. But when you, if a man can drive a tank with a turban, why he can't drive a bus? Yeah. So that's why we won on that protest. The leader of the protest even threatened to set fire to himself in the centre of Wolverhampton. If you have to die, Mr Jolly, it's due to happen on Sunday. Are you not in any way frightened at all by the prospect? Well, I'm not frightened for nothing. I'm not frightened for anything. This is, I shall uh, find it uh, my privilege to sacrifice for the Sikh community. The battle for equal rights triumphed in 1982, when Britain's highest court, the House of Lords, ruled that Sikhs were a distinct ethnic group, protected by the Race Relations Act. This gave the right to wear turbans in all walks of life. Indeed, in all walks of life. All right, mate. As you can see, I'm on yeah. duty right now. Um, I'm wearing the turban as I, uh, as I want at the moment. Yeah. Uh, so it's never held me back in my career. Um, I've never ever suffered any sorts of uh, any kind of discrimination against myself for it. Mm. Um, things might have been different in the past, but yeah. that's the way people, you know, they've learned from their mistakes maybe, and, and today's a very different story. Are you aware of the history and the things that people did? Yeah, I'm aware yeah. of it. Um, in the I'm 60s, aware of it. The bus, yeah, the bus, bus drivers, drivers who, yeah. Yeah, who threatened to set themselves alight. Yeah, good. Yeah, Thanks, so, yes. um, I mean, yeah, so they fought so hard for us to keep our traditions intact while we live in this country. Um, while we go to work and everything, so I'm forever grateful for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, people, the, the Sikhs have done very well with the right to wear the turban. Other religions have done less yeah. well with the, their headwear. Yes. Why do you think the Sikhs kind of have done so well? Um, I think one of the main reasons Sikhs have done so well is because we've integrated so well into this yeah. society, uh, into, into this culture. However, at the same time, while staying true to our own identity, mm. um, and because of that, because we have been involved and you know we're very community orientated it's built into us it's built into our uh, our ethos our ethics and i think that's probably one of the main reasons why we have gone so far ahead i have to say in my six years of service yeah. i've only ever had one racist comment towards myself oh really what was yeah. it <coughs> I, i'm not going to repeat but <coughs> it wasn't very nice but yeah and that was from someone you were arresting? Someone I was arresting, yeah. Oh, okay. So, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, let's put it this way, I've had more yes. outside of the job than inside. Yeah. yeah. For me, it is still startling to see how easily Officer Ashwinder walks around Wolverhampton Wanderers Stadium. In the 80s, my parents kept me inside the house during Wolves games because the supporters were so openly racist and aggressive. I've been walking up and down here today. I haven't had any grief today. Yeah. I'd say... I've, I'd get no more grief than a normal police officer. All right, OK, all right. That's a good point. Yeah. Nowadays, you can even find an official supporters group for Punjabi Wolves fans. So you're the chair of Punjabi Wolves supporters? Yes, director. Director? Chair. Okay, all right. Yeah. So Wolverhampton's probably around 25% ethnic, I think? Yeah. What um, percentage would you say Wolves fans? Of oh, that? Yeah, people of colour. It, it, it's hard to put a percentage on it. I'd say, Roughly, looking at the I'd say about 10 to 12. 10 to 12. Which, so. is, which is good. You know, yeah, it was good and it's growing. In the know? 80s, it would have been no point. One or no one, right? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So Wolves obviously a very tolerant, diverse uh, fan base. I would say so. Other clubs, famously less so. Which ones are the ones? Are there certain clubs you dread playing? <laughs> um, Millwall. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's from Millwall, <laughs> Leeds. Really? So um, are those games, do you feel slightly nervous going to them as a way to support? It's an apprehension, but obviously, as you, if you're gone as a collective, it's, yeah. it's a lot more, it's a lot safer now. Is it? Uh, the way the policing's done, the way it's segregated, you know, and we're coming out of the ground at a different time, yeah. it's, it's a lot safer. It's, okay. it's, you know, it's, it is a very, very safe environment right now. Yeah.
is the house I grew up in, number 60. Uh, my uncle lived in a house at number 68, and these two houses were the family houses when they first arrived in Wolverhampton from India in the late 60s. Uh, these are the houses they moved into and bought. And um, a lot of this housing um, was slum housing, so people didn't actually want to live here. But the immigrants who came here bought the housing, um, and they often borrowed money to each other, they didn't get mortgages. But it seems like um, a tiny house now, and there were six of us in there. Sometimes, um, you know, 12, when families, families were visiting. And there were, I think, six of my cousins in the house down the road there. And um, everyone was Indian, I think, except number 58. And the house at the end over there. But I think this housing was quite cheap, you know. I think, I think, I can't remember exactly. I think my parents bought this for about 700 pounds or something. And now we sold it for when it was about 28,000 pounds. I think it's probably now about 80, 90,000 pounds. But this is how housing has helped social mobility in Britain, you know. It's really helped people go up in the world. Sorry, I, I, grew, I grew up around here about 20 years ago. I lived at number 60, and I've just come back for the first time in about 20 years. Really? Yes. Oh and um, how long have you lived there? Just um, I'm just staying here with my partner. All right, OK. He's only been in here for a couple of months. All right. And what's uh, Park Village like now? Because well, to be honest, which is rough. <laughs> yeah. I say on it. Yeah. Because when I was growing up here, it wasn't rough. No, it is very, very rough now. So how long have you been here? A couple of months now. A couple of months. Mm. And how's it rough? Like the drug stealings and all that going on. Yeah, I've heard about this quite it's a lot. It's really bad. There's yeah. quite a few kind of drug dens around here. There aren't is, there? yeah, yeah. And a few brothels as well. Well, I don't know, but I didn't know that. <laughs> Someone told me that. So is it like, is it not safe? No, it ain't safe. Oh, really? Even to walk down that road at night, it's like, no. Oh, really? Because there's a lot of uh, muggins and stuff like that going on. But well, when I grew up here, it was lovely. Oh, yeah. It was very Indian. I'd imagine it would have been, Everyone yeah. left their doors open, we'd be in and out of each oh, other's houses. Oh, it's back in the good old days, yeah. Is it because all, all these houses are basically rented out now? I think the majority of them seem to be, yeah. Yeah, they never used to be. That one there where I've just come from, on the corner, Yeah. that's actually... That used to be a pub? Yeah, my husband said that, yeah. But Lucian that's... Arms. My yeah, he said that. My dad used to go there to drink. Oh, it's all flats now. Yeah. And again, that's all the... Um, Romanians and stuff like that, which there is, I think it's a two bedroom. There's yeah. nine of them in the two bedroom down there. Nine people in and the two bedroom flat. Yeah, and the landlord doesn't mind that because he sees that it's getting his money. But that's probably illegal, isn't it? Well, we know that. That's yeah. what I'm saying, we know that. But if, it, if the landlord's getting the money, they don't care. Yeah. As long as they put, you know, they've got a roof over their head. And in general, are the landlords Indians? Well, to be honest, the majority of them, yeah. Yeah. Well, they, is, they're they're the people who used to own the property, I guess. No, he's the one that actually... And he's Indian. ...in flats, yeah. Nine people, that's a lot. So this was a pub, and now it's, uh, it's, now it's rented property. But this is one of the contradictions of our culture in that this used to be called the Lewisham Arms, and the landlord was a Sikh guy, and yet it's against our religion to drink. And I always thought that was weird, that a guy with a turban would run a pub. I never really made sense of it. But then I found out when I, when I became an adult that Sikhs have one of the highest rates of alcoholism in the world. <laughs> you hear uh, Eastern European languages being spoken on the streets, whereas, um, in the 80s, everyone was speaking Punjabi, and that was deemed to be a problem. But now the Punjabis are worried about people speaking Eastern European languages on the same streets, so it goes around in circles. The arrival of immigrants in the 60s caused a great deal of political debate. The Conservative Party struggled to deal with mass immigration and considered policies of assisted repatriation and resettlement. They also struggled to find the right language. Some used careful words, but one man, a Tory MP for Wolverhampton, decided not to mince his words. Oh, there's no one there. So this is um, number 79 Meridale Road, which is actually just behind uh, my old school. And this is where Enoch Powell used to live in the 1960s and 1970s. But I didn't realise this was his house um, until I began researching. 
um, his history. And it seems a bit bizarre that Enoch Powell is actually probably the most famous person associated with Wolverhampton in the 20th century. And yet there's no plaque, there's no sign. And that, I think, indicates just what a kind of poisonous uh, legacy his speech, the Rivers of Blood speech, has left. That he's, no one even wants to, you know, recognise the fact that he used to live here. We must be mad, literally mad as a nation, to be permitting the annual inflow of some 50,000 dependents who are for the most part the material of the future growth of the immigrant descended population. It is like watching a nation busily engaged in heaping up its own funeral pyre. Enoch Powell's speech caused a political storm, although many people agreed with his view that immigration had to be reduced, he used controversial language, phrases like wide-grinning pickaninnies to describe black children and the rivers of blood to describe a vision of future racial riots. The Conservative Party dismissed him, but tens of thousands of British people marched in his favour. Send the blacks to Pakistan, hallelujah. When you ask people of my parents' generation what it was like in the 60s and 70s, they often aren't very detailed. I think it was so difficult. I mean, Indians were being beaten up on the streets. Um, pol the police wouldn't investigate crimes that aff affected Asians. And so it was so painful that I think a lot of people don't want to talk about it. Even now, they'll be quite cryptic in terms of what happened. And they wanted to improve their lives. And they don't really want to dwell on the negativity. ਬੋਇਸਗਾ <laughs> ਤੇ ਹੁਣ ਉਹ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਵੀ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਫੈਮਿਲੀ ਆਈ ਆ ਕਹਿੰਦੇ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਲੈ ਕੇ ਸਾਰਿਆਂ ਨੇ ਬਹੁਤ ਕੀਤਾ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਹੁੰਦਾ ਹੈ ਨਿਆਣੇ ਟਾਈਮ ਨਾਲ ਜਿੱਦਾਂ ਜਸਵੀਂ ਸਕੂਲੇ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਆਉਂਦੇ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਸੀ ਬਾਹਰ ਗਾਰਡਨ ਚ ਵੀ ਜਲਤ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਨੀ ਇਦਾਂ ਕੋਈ ਲੈ ਕਰਦੇ ਜੇ ਹੁਣ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਉੱਠ ਕੇ ਦੂਗੇ ਦੀ ਗਾਰਡਨ ਚ ਕੋ ਸਿੱਟੀ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਬਾਹਰ ਖਲੁੱਕੀ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਆ ਜਾਂ ਖਲਾਰਾ ਪਾਈ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਆ ਫਿਰ ਇਦਾਂ ਹੀ ਸਾਰੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਇਦਾਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਦ ਮੀਨਿੰਗ an intention of the Rivers of Blood speech is still debated today. Was it just a frank way of expressing the concerns of Wolverhampton constituents? Or was Powell deliberately trying to stir up racial tension? I'm going to discuss this with Simon Heffer, who wrote a biography about his friend, Enoch Powell, and who now works for the Daily Mail, one of Britain's most right-wing and most popular tabloid newspapers. He was a very complex man. I'm reading your book. I mean, he had a quite um, intimate relationship with India, right? He loved India. Mm. He wanted to be viceroy of India. Yeah. Um, he went out to India in 1943 uh, as a, a soldier. Uh, he loved Indian people. He loved Indian architecture. He thought India had a much more highly developed culture, I think quite rightly, than, than Britain had. Now, I guess this is, this is a really difficult question with Powell, um, but it's the one everyone always asks. Do you think he was right. Not in the way that he would have thought. Um, I mean, the, the complaints from most of the country about immigration in the 60s were about the Afro-Caribbean community. Mm. And I think now everyone would accept that the Afro-Caribbean community has integrated pretty well into Britain. So he was wrong about that. Um, but also the Sikhs. Yeah. I'm a Sikh. Yeah. I, th I think we've probably integrated quite well. He did, yeah, well, I think he... I think Enoch always realised that. I mean, Enoch, because he had such a huge sympathy for India, but uh, I think he was well aware that there were large uh, Muslim communities 
already in the 60s in the West Midlands, in West London, in parts of Yorkshire and Lancashire, that uh, where there was no sign that people wanted to integrate and their numbers were too large for them effectively to integrate. I mean, he always said he had no objection to immigration to this country, provided it was in numbers that were sufficiently manageable, that the people who came here could uh, be uh, could be accommodated within our culture. It was when the numbers got so large that you ended up having ghettos. That was what worried him. So uh, w an important question is whether the debate he was involved in in the 60s and the 70s is now being repeated now. Are there differences about what people are talking about or are we just having the same conversation all over again? There are big differences. I, I mean, He was talking about the sheer numbers of immigrants which were small compared with today. Oh, were they? I mean, um, much yes. smaller. Yeah. yeah, they were much smaller. I mean, I, I saw there was a net immigration last year of 243,000 people to this country. In the 60s, it was probably 50, 60,000 a year. It was much smaller. Oh, so it's much bigger now. Okay. It's, mu it's much bigger now. But of course, they are different people. Mm. They are, as it were, people who are of the same European origins as the rest of us, many of them. Mm. You know, it's now become an, a more an economic issue, not a cultural one. It's why are these Poles coming here to take all my jobs, and so on and so forth. And that's the argument that we're having today. Do you think that the, the wave of mass immigration we had in the 60s and 70s worked out in the end? I think broadly speaking it did, yes. yes. Uh, do, do you think that could happen again with the people coming now? One of the problems we've got now is just how crowded a little island this is. We've still got two and a half million people unemployed in this country. And many of those people are the demoralised uh, white working class who say, oh, I'm not going to do that job because there'll be a poll who'll do it. I mean, you know, some of our people have got to get off their backsides and go to work. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Nigel Farage. Enoch Powell's modern political counterpart is Nigel Farage. He is leader of the UK Independence Party and member of the European Parliament. Just as Powell thought it was madness to have open borders with the Commonwealth, Farage and his party think it is insanity to have open borders for the European Union. That's the main reason they want Britain out of the Union. They want the UK to set its own immigration policy and reduce immigration by 80%. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I tell you what, there's only one political party in this country today that's got real energy, optimism and enthusiasm, and you're sitting right in front of me. Thank you. UKIP's victory in the European elections last year gave a stunning warning to the established political parties. UKIP's aim now is to get seats in the British National Parliament. So far, they have succeeded in two instances. I would like you, please, uh, to give a warm welcome uh, to somebody who's not a member of our party. He's a member of Parliament for the Conservative Party. But he's coming to have a chat to our conference this afternoon, and I think it'll be interesting to hear what he's got to say, don't you? Yeah. Would you please give a warm welcome to Mark Reckless, Conservative member of Parliament. Today, I am leaving the Conservative Party and joining UKIP. I promised a straight in-out referendum. I can't keep that promise as a Conservative. I can keep it as UKIP. The big problem, I think, in Britain is immigration. Not, a, not against people coming to this country to work, but everybody seems to land in Italy, pass their way through, and they all end up in most of them end up in Britain because we're a soft touch of Europe. 
we're the only country in the world, I think, has got free national health service. My father used to say, if everybody lived in their own country, it'd be a wonderful world. <laughs> it's like somebody telling someone else, you must let this person into your house. And when this person is in your house, you must let his, his children and his uncles and his aunt and his whole family into your house. And when he's there, you must support him. Well, that is what the, our government is doing to our country. We not only get doctors and uh, engineers and that, we get the murderers and the, yeah, the, the, the thieves yeah. and the, <laughs> the, the drug addicts. Yeah. They all come over. Once they're here, they're here. You cannot send because them away. Because they've got human rights. Because they've got human, the human rights. Human rights, UKIP wants to reform that. Right. At the moment, murderers and rapists and so on, they've got more rights than the victims' families. <laughs> and if a murderer in the UK has married somebody in the UK and had a family, it's their human rights so and we can't deport them. But what about the victims' human rights? It's all common sense. It doesn't take an Einstein. When we get into power, not if, when, the people of the United Kingdom will be asked one question. Do you want to be in Europe or out of Europe? You tell us. We'll do what you want. That'll be a refreshing change. We've got it, enough immigrants coming into this country every year to fill a major city. Mm. Now think of what that's doing to uh, the general population. 25% of the children born in this country are now the children of immigrants. We are a united Great Britain. Yeah. We, we can do it on our own, thank you very much. The flag of my union, my country, is made up of three flags. The Saltaire for Scotland, yeah? The red and white St George's flag for England and the other lot, yeah? That's your red, white and blue. I'm an Englishman and very happy and proud of that. Uh, nothing against the Scottish, the Irish or the Welsh, but that's my country, England. I'm not European, I am English. I'm proud to be United Kingdom. The influence of UKIP is apparent in the fact that it's very hard to find any political figures in Britain that will defend immigration, even though all the research shows that immigration has enhanced the economic prosperity of Britain. I think all the politicians I know of, all the established ones, are campaigning to be uh, increasingly anti-immigration. Suddenly all the leaders of the parties are, are kind of uh, following the UKIP agenda on immigration and, and trying to, uh, you know, beat UKIP at their own game and it's kind of changed the tone of political discussion in this country really. Nowadays, in the eyes of Simon Heffer and UKIP, the Poles are the problem. When Poland joined the EU in 2004, the UK immediately allowed Poles to work here without any restrictions. The government expected 13,000 Poles to move. It was a huge underestimate. More than half a million Poles are now living in the UK, and many of them in this region. At first it was really hard because obviously of the language barrier, but I think with time you kind of get used to it. So when you say it's a different atmosphere, what do you mean by that? Um, obviously every country has different culture, so England is more open to like different nationalities and stuff. It's multicultural, so yes. life is completely different. My parents came here in 1968 and there was a lot of anti-immigration feeling towards Indians then. There were riots on the streets and you know, politicians saying send them back. And it seems like it's happening all over again. Sometimes 
I feel that it's just not fair because we are working here. We are paying tax, we are paying for everything. And uh, some people are still complaining that we shouldn't be here. Well, it seems like they, they want your services and yeah. everyone wants a Polish builder yeah. and a Polish plumber. Exactly. But they don't want to live with the social consequences of having exactly. different people. Exactly. And often the people complaining about immigration are the ones who have no experience. I don't know any immigrants. And how does your mum feel? Does she miss Poland? Don't miss Polish. A lot. Yeah. A lot. You go to school? Yeah. And you speak with an English accent. Do you see, see yourself as Polish or British? I don't know. Polish. Polish. <laughs> you speak Polish? Yeah. Yeah, but you speak English to your friends, yeah? Yeah. Okay, do you support an English football team? Awesome. See, I knew. So, um, <laughs> do, you, do you want to go back to Poland? <laughs> Or not? Not really. No. A little bit. A little bit, <laughs> but you'd rather stay here. Britain is moving from being a monocultural country of stiff upper lips and cream teas and formal Christianity to something much more complicated, colourful and diverse. I feel fortunate to have grown up here in Wolverhampton, a city of the future. We went through the experience of mass immigration decades before the rest of the country. We long ago embraced a new reality that Britain at large is still struggling to accept. Why do you think English people don't want to do this kind of work? They want to be the weak and free, the English. They want their time well, off. They, that's why. You're saying the hardest working people are from Iraq? Albania. And where? Albania. Albania? Yeah. All right, okay. And you are Iraqi? Yeah. Oh, Iraqi. I'm from Iraq. I'm from and I've got to say, if my parents' generation is anything to go by, or my own experience as a second-generation immigrant. The story will not necessarily end badly. I look high, I look low, I'm looking everywhere I go. Looking for a home in the heart of the country. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If so, you can watch the next episode here. Or check another recommended series on our channel. And don't forget to subscribe to get updates on new series.